Welcome to The Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading property experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel, and Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investment Professionals of Australia, and the 2014 and 2015 Property Investment Advisor of the Year. All right, folks, you're on The Property Couch, where each week Ben and I bring you the insider's guide to property investing, and every week, mate, you normally standing on the couch, but this week not feeling so great with the back. Yeah, no, no, the, we've we had an op, uh, mm. as everyone knew last week, but uh, we're just, yeah, still on the fence as to how well it's gone, but um, yeah, so... Bit of fatigue, bit of uh, boosters in in terms of painkillers in the system. So if I start rabbiting on, I don't make any sense, it's just like every other week on the podcast. I was going to say, just rewind 101 <laughs> episodes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but... Um, Big I, week. I have a Spence quintessential Aussie guy. You ask him how he is. Generally, he's like, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. The only time you can tell when he's in a little bit of pain, he just gets a little bit grumpy. Oh. Gets a little bit grumpy. Short. Doesn't it? Yeah. Or well, maybe that's the drug, that's drug assisted. Yeah, yeah. What am I grumpy with at the moment? No, no, no. You're normally just pretty, you're normally even keel. But you, you, Mate, I'm up and about. Oh, I'm grumpy about the topic today. Well, so, you know, great, great segue. I might even call Bulldust on it, but we've got some really exciting <laughs> stuff. Let's get into the fun stuff first. We, we have got some fun stuff, but uh, see, it's a bit do we touch you? Yeah, do you know what I'm But uh, <laughs> 1 million and 27, Ben. Uh, is that what we just got someone to sponsor us for? <laughs> <laughs> That's not your monthly salary. <laughs> no, it's 1 million and 27 thousand downloads. Just a leftover go little from sort Australia of day. From Australia Day celebration. <laughs> A million, mate. Can you that's believe great. that? Thank, thanks, thanks for listening. <laughs> thanks, for listening. <laughs> thanks for listening. Mate, thanks for sharing. Thank, hopefully, hopefully you've got some value out of it. Mate, we, we've been getting some really great feedback from people. They've been giving us. I mean, our, our listeners are very generous. They're, yep. We're, we're keen to give back, and they're keen to give back to us with some really generous. Oh, as long as they're, as long as they're making smart decisions with their money, they are, and they're buying the right type of properties. Um, yep, we they're might get patted on the back in two years, oh, which is great. Good. So um, awesome. So today's topic is going to be housing affordability. Yeah, has to be. Lots of, lots Mate, of. It's everywhere. It's we everywhere. need to talk to it. But uh, I want to quickly start with uh, mindset minute. Is that all right? Yeah, to- totally. Let's get into it. I-, I love starting with positivity, positivity, and then I'll bring it down. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, uh, today um, Jim Rohn's comment is: um, motivation is what get you started. Habit is what keep you going. Oh, motivation is what gets you started. Habit. I love it. I love it. So yep. a couple of practical yep. examples. I have wanted, I, I'm uh, recovering from a, a bit of adrenal fatigue, you know yep. that? So it means that no. I can't, you, yeah. No, well, thanks for sharing. Should we take a seat on the couch? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell me how you, you feel. Yeah. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so I can't over exuberate myself because it'll um, it'll burn me out really quickly. But I still want to keep fit and exercise. So yep. I decided that I'm going to do, ready for this? All right, ready. Push-ups every morning, right? Oh, yeah, right. And can so, we, can and we get a video of this? And, and, here's, and here's the big number 10. 10? Yeah. Okay. And, and uh, a couple of our listeners, a couple of our <laughs> gym going <laughs> listeners are going, just spat their morning coffee. That is not it. impressive what? at all. Yeah, yeah. But I'll tell you what I reckon is impressive. What's what? the date today? It's the 9th of February. Yeah. 31, not 40 days in a row, I've done 10 push ups. That's good. So, so it's becoming. So I said to Andrea, my wife, yep. I said, I need to form the habit. I'll, yep. I'll increase the load later, yep. but I need the habit now. Because oh, I was all motivated, New Year's yep. resolution, all that sort of stuff. But without the habit, I'm like everyone else who's not at the gym car park. You know, the gym car park's full in January. Correct. Empty in February. Yeah. So that's one thing. Um, habit's what's keeping me going. I actually look forward to it now. The kids come uh, into the lounge room with me in the morning. They do it with me. And I'm having visions of putting the kids on your back. They jump on my back. Whilst you're doing one hand. Yeah. Yeah. Push up. Oh, so you were peeking in this yeah, morning. This is very good. Then the other one is uh, Andrea, my dearly beloved, bought me a guitar uh, two, oh, year, two years ago. Yeah. I've wanted to do it for a long time. I'm yeah. a left side thinker. I can't switch my mind off. I'm yeah. just, you know, head miles. So I thought the guitar would be perfect, but I'm like everyone who wants to, to play the guitar. Mm. It just sits in the cupboard. So again, 10 minutes a day. Mate, I am 21 days in, 10 Ooh. minutes a day. I, now I know why the songs say you play until your fingers bleed, because yes. it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> and one thing that's getting me through is a Tim Ferriss post on it, um, yeah. showing me the 10 minute um, cycle. Yeah. yeah, yeah, great. And he said to me, among other things, the way you can stay focused is to remember that Justin Bieber, the most effeminate male he knows, yeah. taught himself the guitar before he was 12. So get over your sore fingers, because people have to get through it. So well, Ed Sheeran did these just 10,000 hours, like, you know, yep. Didn't watch TV, just yep. basically sat there and did his 10,000 hours and he's obviously 
Well, the hottest property, isn't he? Mate, he's in... terrific. Oh, he's fantastic. <laughs> I love him. He's so great. my goal is um, not this Easter, but next Easter to be playing. At, we go away at Easter time to get the guitar and play a few songs with people can actually. Well, make I won't tell so you my saxophone story. Yeah, tell me, tell well, me. very quickly, 30th birthday, wanted a saxophone. Um, so I think everyone kicked in for my 30th birthday, got me some cash. I think I got the saxophone um, about two years ago. <laughs> so what's that, 40, 43, 40, 44? Yeah. Um, and, yep, yeah, it's uh, sitting in storage. 10 yeah, minutes a day. I know. I, Man, I'm, having, so the little reed or whatever it is, I, I got two little reeds with it and I busted both of them. <laughs> so I, I haven't gone down the music show. But I, yeah, look. Yeah. Here's so, the deal. We'll plan to go away next Easter, our families together, and you and I can sit by the campfire <laughs> yeah. and entertain it. Maybe. But it's, I've got to be motivated. So hence the point you were making before. Once you actually know you want to do it. Now, I've you know, visualised one day that I want to learn a musical instrument, but I haven't obviously been motivated mm. enough. But when you do start... Mate, I'm on fire, so I'll let you know how I'm going with that. Oh, yeah. well, but how does that re- how does it relate to property? Uh, the money smart spend. Everyone's everyone's motivated totally. New Year's Eve to fix their financial future. Totally. But it's actually the money smarts that mm. is the habit yes. that'll keep you going. And so that was obviously my lead up. I love to, it. I love the little connection because on the property couch on the homepage you can get the money smart system for free. Ben, we probably should have charged a buck just so that someone placed a value on that because if someone doesn't have that, mm. it might be just too flippant because it's free. It is a game changer. It is. And can you remember when you first implemented, because i got to say, you introduced me to the Money Smarts. It's yep. um, brainchild of you and Popey. Yep. Can you remember back when you first implemented it? Oh, totally. Can, it, it just, it's just about awareness. It's about you know seeing it, making the invisible visible. Where does it all go? Didn't, it's not about cutting back your spending if you don't have to, but it's just about knowing where, where it all goes. Yeah. Well, the point in that is that I remember because it was a few years ago, my wife and I um, were trying to rein in some, some spending habits that we wanted to look after the pennies and let the pounds take care of themselves. Yep. And I've got to tell you, in the first six weeks of implementing the money smarts, you derail all the time. Mm. But the point is you keep going. Correct. You build the habit. Really good point. And eventually, you won't keep going back to the well. Eventually, you won't keep spending $17 here, $22 there. Eventually, you rein it in. So it's a message to all of our listeners who have started the money smarts mm. and are finding that they are getting derailed. Stay true. Totally. And it's not the big expenditures like the you know the LED TVs and all of that that blow the budget usually. It is just the quick shop down there, um, smack it on the credit card, buy this pair of shoes, this is on sale, that's on sale. It's that discretionary stuff that, that makes the big difference over 20 or 30 years. So. so there you go, folks. The mindset theme for today, motivation is what gets you started, but habit is what keeps you going. So uh, write in, let us know what habits um, help you get started. For the totally. Year. And you know we've got some exciting things that are going to come up throughout the year on Money Smarts. Mm-hmm. Um, we're doing a lot of work behind the scenes. So um, that I'm super excited about in, you know, hopefully middle of the year, we'll have some big announcements there. All right, so unleash the beast, Ben. Housing affordability. Can we set the scene here? We've, um, we've had a few um, public figures talk about um, housing affordability. Barnaby Joyce has proposed that everyone moves to Tamworth. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's where he lives, um, where the population is 3,728. It's about 800 kilometres west of Brisbane because it's affordable there. Mm-hmm. That didn't go down well. Um, <laughs> The Weekend Australian's uh, Bernard Salt, or Bernard Salt, he suggested that um, everyone stop eating smashed avocado for breakfast. And the flip side of that is... $24 smashed avocado breakfasts. Um, and start saving. And that, that went down really well, didn't it? Yep. And then, of course, you've got uh, Scott Morrison, who went over to probably the most one of the most unaffordable cities in the world, taxpayer expenses, um, to just confirm that we need to create more supply. Correct. So that, that was money well spent. But um, clearly it's hit the charts, it's hit the uh, the headlines because um, everyone wants to get on, on the great Australian dream and not everyone can at the minute. Well, so you know, I'll follow up with another stat. So in the past 20 years, just to give you an idea, um, 12 times the average household income is what it costs you to afford a house in Sydney. Okay. Mm-hmm. Compared to 20 years ago, it was up from four times. Mm-hmm. So we've gone from four times to 20 times. Now, that is a product of a very wealthy society, okay? Double household incomes. We are starting to see Sydney and Melbourne uh, become international cities. We've got the second best highest standard of living in the world uh, per Aren't capita. Are we the most livable city? Uh, we're definitely the most livable city, but in terms of um, standard of living and how we measure that, we are right up there. Um, in terms of wealth, per nation, per capita, I think we sit top four, top five. So this 
This is a challenging situation and it's gone political because of Labor's uh, and the Greens trying to connect negative gearing and blaming investors uh, for making housing more more expensive. And I think that's probably where I want to go with this. We need to have a sensible conversation. I'll, I might get heated later on but and I'll call bulldust on a few things. But that's, that's the main part. Now I'll throw another little stat in here as well. Um, over that same 20 year period, Stamp duty in Sydney has gone up 750%. Mm. 750% raise in stamp duty. So there's obviously um, home buyers and investors pay their way. Mm. They pay their way in regards to providing all of this enormous amount of revenue. I mean, Sydney's new infrastructure projects have been built on the back of increased stamp duty revenues. Now that's a state-based um, tax. So the federal government are getting a bit of that action. So hence, that's why they want to talk about or weave the whole conversation around investors coming into the... It's helping create the, um, the health of that economy too, because they've, they've huge infrastructure spend since they changed the government. So therefore, that's creating more jobs, which has the multiplier effect. So I think there's a lot of people who, you know, are wishing that houses were lower. Yeah. But when, when you think about that, um, if it was, banks would become tighter with credit. Yes. Um, the security of the mortgages become less. That means that jobs in the property, finance um, uh, industries will become very vulnerable. State government, as you talked about, state governments have less stamp duty. Retail activity will slow down. Mate, it's so it has an enormous knock-on effect. So in reality, the, the headlines are let's make prices more affordable. But to be honest, most people want them to be more expensive. Well, you'd, you'd think so. I mean, that's that's the thing here. There is no win-win. I mean, you know, look at Donald Trump. I mean, he's annoying, that man. But, um, you know, the, the whole make America great again, America number one, you know, and there's some fantastic, you know, YouTube things about, well, can we be number two out there at the moment, which I think is very funny. You should check them out. <laughs> you know, if you want to be number one America, can we be number two? Um, in fact, there was one on Australia last night um, on the ABC with... Um, uh, I'm trying to think of the guy, the comedian. Oh, I can't think. Newsweek? Is it Newsweek? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah anyway. um, um, well, there's one that... Charles Pickering. Charlie Pickering. Oh, Charlie, Charlie Pickering. Pickering, yeah. yeah, yeah. He did it was very good. Have you seen um, the memes where... The, we might have to get a link to that, I think. The, the CIA, the there's a meme where the CIA has uncovered a plot um, by al-Qaeda terrorists to sit back and just let America collapse. So, Donald, if you're listening, the, the whole idea in, in life is to try and get a win-win outcome. All right. It's written a book because on that. it's really important to try and get a win-win outcome. But the way in which you're approaching things, it's not 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 going so well for you. Coming back to that, if we make more properties affordable, there's going to be a consequence to that. So think about this. I mean, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Smith out in the outer suburbs of Sydney, where property prices, in my view, are absolutely overvalued. Mm -hmm. right? I've I've called it before, in terms of household income. When we're talking about 20 times, and we use, a, we use a methodology, guys, where we're talking about household income as a percentage of an 80% 80, um, 80 LVR, loan-to-value ratio on a mortgage, when I see that above 40%, I panic. Okay, So I do not like to see areas. There's very little capital growth that will come into areas where, you know, in the outer suburbs especially. Now, what's the logic behind that? The logic behind that, we talked about this before, is that in the affordable areas is where we normally have the lower skilled workers, the entry level people who have stretched themselves to the max to get into the market because they've got FOMO, okay? And they are, you know, in, when recessionary environments come or downturns come, they're the first people to be laid off. All right, so then there's mortgage stress in those areas. Now, we have seen mortgage stress in the last 12 months increase by 25%, but that's off a base of like 1% or half of 1%. So, you know, that's just the media beating it up. So come back to that point. So imagine if I've just, Mr. and Mrs. Smith has spent five years saving their deposit mm. and they go off and buy their home, all right, and for the next 15 years, the value of their home increases by less than inflation. And when you factor in the interest that they've just been paying to own that property, so you know, think of it like this. If I've taken a $500,000 mortgage over a 30-year term, the interest that I will pay if I take 30 years to pay that offer will be around $560,000 to $580,000, right, depending on the interest rate of the day. So that property is going to owe me over that 30-year period at least in excess of $1.1 in today's dollar terms or thereabouts. Now, if you look at it like that, 
there will be a tipping point. So if governments decide that they need, to, that it's a right for every Australian, and I do believe in every Australian having the opportunity to buy property. Mm -hmm. Please make no mistake about um, our beliefs that if people want the great Australian dream, we think it should be obtainable for everyone. But we need to be realistic here. Bryce, you mentioned it earlier before about the UK market. You know, he's gone to London. They don't have negative gearing. He's gone to other parts of the world. We don't need to go to those parts. China doesn't have negative gearing. Hong Kong doesn't have negative gearing. New York doesn't have negative gearing. All of these places and the property prices are extraordinary in certain locations. Mm. So there's the key in certain locations. Yeah, that's right. So what what potentially government um, intervention could do if they're talking about a blanket opportunity for people to buy property is to slow the value of properties down in these locations. So there could come a tipping point where it actually may be better to rent in that location and invest your money elsewhere. Mm. Now we've talked about rent vesting before and we know that you know uh, financially you are better off to rent vest. But imagine, yeah, you know, and, and this is my warning to all the people who are looking to buy in the outer suburbs of Melbourne and Sydney right now, mm. all right? People are still feeling like they're going to miss out and property prices are gonna to continue to keep growing. The reality is in three or four years, I'm almost certain of this unless there's some global economic um, mayhem, um, which will keep interest rates lower, is that those property prices will be worth the same and if not potentially less than what they're worth today. And I'll just give you some stats, mate, because mm. I'm on my high horse, yeah, go so I'll it. keep going. Okay. But the last big cycle of um, property prices in Sydney was 2001 to 2004. Okay, so that was the last big run that we've seen. In fact, it's a bigger run than what we've seen today. But you know, with 2017, property prices are still probably going to increase and we'll talk more about what's happening in the market to close out this session. But here's, here's an interesting point. So between, the, between that period of time, for units as an example, in 2001 to 2004, the number of suburbs, 295 suburbs, had um, average growth of 13.96%, right? So that, and only four suburbs actually didn't grow in value. Yep. There was actually negative 5.4%. Now, that's the boom and then the, the bust, so that's average growth, annual growth. Now, in terms of the bust or the slowdown, the correction, in 2004 to 2007, there was 116 suburbs that still had growth and it was moderate at 3.8%. So that's about location, location, location in terms of the inner city areas would have probably held it, held their own. And that's about a third. Correct, roughly a, a third. third. And 183 suburbs had negative growth of 2.8% over that period. Mm. For, for From 2004 to 2007, property runs in cycles. Um, now for houses, same sort of thing, 519 suburbs analysed. Um, we had annual growth of 18.68% over that three year period. Incredibly strong numbers, because that's compounding return. Right? From 2004 to 2007, 117 suburbs continued to grow mm. by 2.6%. But the other area in terms of 342 suburbs had negative growth. Of 2.7%. It's compelling. So the message here, and, and this comes back to why is this a political hot potato right now? Because we are right in the midst of the top end of the cycle when it comes to affordability. In 2022, we will not be talking about affordability mm -hmm. because if, if interest rates are back at sort of 5 5.5%, 6%, there will be households out in the outer suburbs where you know, that's taking about $300, $400 a month out of their mm. family budget. Yeah. Now that is going to cripple them mm. and that is going to see more and more property. So that will automatically see further supply coming on. That will also put pressure on rents. So putting, bringing it back to an investor story, that'll put pressure on rents out there because there will be an oversupply. Scott Morrison has it 100% right when he talks about supply is our problem. Okay, because we have a growing population and that is a really important message there. That, but what you can't do in inner city areas of Melbourne and Sydney, Brisbane, Adelaide, we bang on about this all the time, we can't create more land there and the land that is there is utilised with a house on it. 
So, yeah, we can knock that house down and put more bedrooms on it, but that's not going to be more, more residents. And we are, we're absolutely seeing you know, groups of houses lining up and knocking them down to, to build you know, medium-density, high-density apartments. Mm. That is going to continue as we go forward. Yeah, no, look, I, and affordable is not an issue in Perth, Darwin, Hobart, lifestyle markets. No. So it's just a, a Melbourne and Sydney story. So we've got to get comfortable with the fact that Melbourne and Sydney are now world cities, and they weren't when we were growing up, or not as much. Yeah. But they're big cities. They're attracting world. They're, they're attracting global talent. <coughs> therefore, they have to pay global salaries. Therefore, the prices in those cities reflect global cities. And so that's just something that people need to be comfortable for. But it's interesting. I had a uh, an opportunity to to write to Scott Morrison via the Money Magazine. You did. Yep. I was uh, one of a number of contributors. And my question to him is, what are you going to do with the affordability story? And I got, I got the Dear Johnny response. And I, what I can't work out is, I know that they've had a discussion around a fast rail network before, and it's mm. fallen down. Mm. And I know last year there was a big group got together. It was a private consortium with some pretty powerful power brokers, you know, ex-state uh, uh, premiers who were lending their Think voice to yeah, yeah, them. Yeah, the truck. At John Simon, there's lots of people with with powerful voices behind mm. it. It seems to me, what, what's the what's the hold up with um, with these population centres that are an hour or two hours out of the the two major capitals and connecting those via a fast rail network uh, through to Canberra, which will put some still give people access to a capital city job market, but also give them some lifestyle and affordability option further out, and also create some amenities around some of these bigger population centres. If a private consortium was prepared to come in, build the rail network in return for some of this land that's just out there mm. so that they can make a profit through the development. It seems to me I can't, I can't logically, you know, politics aside, I can't logically see why that would not be a vote getter mm. um, and create a win-win situation for everyone. I'm, I'm, I'm failing to see how that that argument keeps missing. You know, the, the other side of the Great Dividing Range, you know, from Melbourne, we get all the, bo- the bad weather along the coast. The other side of the Great Dividing Range has more sunshine hours than Queensland. Mm. It's beautiful country up there. You've got the Murray River. It just makes, you know, people would choose to live up there if they could get to a major centre within an hour. Mm. And they can sit on the, you know, they'll have high-speed internet. Some work done. They'll yeah. get some work done. They'll be, they'll be productive. So that, that is obviously, you know, one of our solutions mm. that we will keep banging on about. Um, it is a big investment, but it has a long-term payoff. But I'm also, there's media commentators and, and economists and, and even uh, people writing in, you know, I, I, I got an article to, for the new Premier, Gladdy from um, New South Wales, and there was 11 things that you can do. One, one journalist wrote this story, I'm like, oh, it scared the crap out of me. It, it, it showed me that um, a lot of Australians don't understand the dynamics of our economy. And one of the big pushes is they want to reduce the amount of immigration mm. coming into this country. So there's this, there's this um, ageing population who are feeling that we're growing too quick. Right? Now, in terms of primary production, we export two thirds of what we produce. In other words, we make so much food, right, that we have to move it offshore for our farmers to enjoy the lifestyles that they're enjoying and to get return and our winemakers and everyone. The primary producers, we basically export two thirds of that. So our two biggest exports are obviously rocks. Rocks, so coal and iron ore, right? Now, we are susceptible to potentially, you know, a changing environment um, overseas where if we all start to have protectionism, then that's going to affect China. China's not going to buy our rocks, okay? And that's going to affect jobs and we're going to see potentially recessionary uh, environment. Now, what people fail to see from an immigration point of view is that Australia is becoming a service economy, right? We, we are a service economy. So the majority of our GDP comes from services. Now, the services... Knowledge, the knowledge industry. Yeah, we're a knowledge... So it's, but that's when people arrive here, um, they need healthcare, they need... Um, retail people, they need, you know, shelter, all of the fundamental things, and that's all considered services, you know. So we, if we were to stop our population growth, whether it be through natural um, childbirth or immigration, we'd act, our economy would actually stall. Hmm. And then, not stall, it would collapse. In fact, um, PwC, you can get your hands on it, it's on their website, have released a, a long-term 2050 view of Australia. And they're saying that Australia is potentially going to slow down its growth. Okay, so they're talking about that um, we're a mature, um, wealthy nation. So the the long-term 3.3 to 4% growth, which is what 
the RBA and, and the government's looking for. That's where inflation's nicely balanced, mm. and usually that means we've got a full employment environment. Right now, our economy is growing between 2 and 3%, and that means we, we talk about, we bang on about spare capacity in the economy. So we absolutely need these. We need to grow as an, a nation, and we need to welcome more and more people here. And these people who are going to come here are hopefully going to develop the next world's best solar technology that we can export to the world. We need to get smarter. You know, we've got brilliant biotech, uh, CSL world leader in blood plasma. These are the types of things we need to continue to keep focusing on, on STEM and build that wealth and be, be thankful for the fact that our property prices are holding up. You know, we, we talked about the wealth effect before too. If people's property prices aren't growing, the, the wealth effect is that people stop spending mm -hmm. and send them it starts to change and everyone starts to save their pennies. Now that is also gonna create less jobs. So there is a flow on effect and coming back to that win-win story I was saying before, what we've got to understand is that you want Australians who own property for their property prices to continue to keep growing. It's their biggest nest egg. It's their biggest wealth base. Mm. And people will choose to move out to Toowoomba. Was it Toowoomba? Barnaby Joyce um, oh. is location. <laughs> like they will. There will be a people who will choose to get off the, the merry-go-round that is our big cities. Mm. But there will be other people in our big cities who thrive on the metropolis. Mm. They thrive on the, the living and lifestyle benefits the that come. They want the buzz mm. and and they know that if they get the buzz in New York, they're more likely gonna be renters. If they get the buzz in London, they're more likely to be renters. Hong Kong, I can go on and on and on. And the, the gap between the haves and the have-nots in those cities are enormous. Totally enormous. Mm. And, and so, you know, I hate the politics being played around this topic, all right? There is no easy fix. I love the idea of the initiatives um, around potentially having super funds um, and having some types of construction of affordable apartments because there's absolutely no way known that anyone's going to be able to do affordable houses within 15 kilometres of the two major. It's just not going to happen. Mm. So people have got to, you know, we've got to convince the community that living in apartments is actually a really acceptable and an aspirational thing to do closer in. But even with these initiatives, they might generate, say, 10, 20 or 30,000 apartments over the course of 10 years. Now, that might seem like a lot, but you've got to remember we generate each year between, on average, 160,000 new dwellings a year in the peak um, situation like we are in at the moment, low interest rates, we've got a booming um, construction, um, there's lots of planning approvals coming through. We're, we're peaking at that sort of 200, 220. We're coming off that number at the moment. So the reality there is that that will not solve the appetite for more people who want to live closer in. It, it's just not going to solve it. So mm -hmm. let's let's just take a take a chill pill and understand that because we, we don't argue the same thing for for New York, we don't argue the same thing for London. We're accepting of that fact, but. But with that said, you know, we've got some other ideas around solutions as well, um, you know, in terms of what, the, what they are. There's no doubt multiple business zones or business hubs are really important. You know, you've got Chatswood, you've yeah, got Parramatta, you've got North Sydney, you've got Sydney. In, in Melbourne, we've got basically um, CBD, we've got St Kilda Road, uh, but there will be more. And Docklands. Yeah, Docklands, the, absolutely. It's almost the CBD. Coming, coming up to that. So, and then you've got to get um, quick quick transport to those to those nodes. If you can get great transport connections to those nodes and the inf you get the critical population, then the nice restaurants will start to appear. Mm. The infrastructure will start to be, the arts community will start to thrive. The, you know, there'll be the culture that will, you know, will, will attract people to those particular areas. So, you know, for me, we absolutely need to do that. I, I would also be shouting out to developers that we talk about practicality test. You know, if I want to have two kids, I'm not going to live in a two-bedroom apartment, developers. So start building me three and four-bedroom apartments with two car spots, mm. all right? And build them in medium density. And, and, you know, people will start to be accepting of eight to ten apartments, 12 apartments in some areas, as long as you give me the number of car parks I need and the three bedrooms mm. and potentially two living zones. Mm -hmm. You know, if you give me that as a footprint, and I know the build cost is high, but you give me that, I'll pay for that. You know, and I'll pay a million, mil, mil and a half for that opportunity as opposed to the three million for the house. So, you know, take, take note of that. And now that doesn't sound like affordable, does it?
<laughs> when I'm just sort of saying those numbers. But Well, the, the thing is, um, there is affordable housing close in. You, you just got to reframe what you want. I yeah. mean, I could find you a one-bedroom flat. If you're a 30-something, I could find you a one-bedroom flat in the in the 10, 15 kilometre that's affordable on your income, mm. but it just means that you're not going to get the palace first up. You've got to... You've got to start and build your way up. Um, and equally, you know, if you buy an affordable house, the, the, there is a solution. You can go and talk to mum and dad, and that's typically what a lot of people are doing, to say, can you help me? I can't afford, I can't save the deposit quick enough to actually to buy. But uh, and this is the bit where, you know, I, I get we've got Gen Ys listening and they yeah, get upset yeah, by this discussion, but you can't have a lifestyle and save for a deposit. Kind of both. No. If you want lifestyle, yeah. you can't have a deposit because you've got to have some form of sacrifice that comes, and we've done that. Yep. So if you want to have designer jeans and, dare I say it, smashed avocado on the weekend mm. and live a really great lifestyle, you're choosing that over and above buying a house. And that's okay, but you can't have a foot in each can. No, I think you know some of the commentators out there have also said to save $50,000 for a double household income... Oh, Something just jumped in my head. I do feel sorry for a single parent. I'm, Absolutely, you know, right. like that—that that is just um, one. There's obviously there are minorities that get affected. Yeah, and look, absolutely, they need to be. Supported. You know, and, and in a capitalist environment, that is true. You, you want to try and bring as many people along on the journey as you possibly can. But the fact of the matter is, whether it be Australia or anywhere in the world, a single mum or a single dad on one income is more than likely not going to be able to live in Mayfair Park Lane. Um, or you know downtown Manhattan or any of those types of areas, unless they're you know being very fortunate with what they do and they can you know they can uh, pay someone to assist with uh, raising their child. That that is difficult, and and that has been a combination of double household incomes as well. We've had this tremendous amount of growth over last you know twenty to thirty years that we've had. No one would disagree with that. That's not the reason for the headline, though, is it? No. You know that part of the community you want to definitely help. And that that's the anger part for me around you know why I'm calling bulldust on Ooh. the Labor. Party and the Greens. Talked about chill pills before. Oh, is, I'm not sure he's had any this morning. Is because um, they're trying to manipulate. Bit, bit, you know, showing my colours here today. But same with Trump, in terms of false, false hope. Mm. He's potentially giving false hope to a lot of America. And I could be proven wrong, and I'll be the first to apologise. Whether those jobs will come back into the steel belt that he's promising, but it, that's what he's built. You know, that's how he's got into power. And I'm saying the same thing to Labor. You know, and to the Greens, you guys don't know what you're talking about. In terms of your changes, and you keep banging on about negative gearing and capital gains provisions as being the reason why property prices are too high in certain locations, I can tell you right now, uh, for those millennials listening to us, you are not going to be able to afford in Clifton Hill, you're not going to be able to afford in Surrey Hills and Sydney um, on a simple um, general household wage. Yep. You're just not going to get there. So mm. we've got to move on from that. But build build a location or, or choose to rent there and invest as we've talked about before. It's a really important message because, you know, the, the, the forces here are human interest and human behaviour. They're forces around people wanting to live where they want to live and they'll pay a premium for it. They don't give a, two, two sparrows around the idea that the average income can't afford the house that they're doing. They're going to their mortgage broker and they're basically getting their approval because they're probably bringing home 300 in household income and they can afford to spend $2 million on a property. So it's really understanding that. In the outer suburbs, yeah, I still think we can do more around building cheaper housing um, and you know the supply of land being released. I've, I've banged on about that before as well. That's absolutely true. And I do think, you know, as we talked about before, the high-speed rail, as you mentioned, Bryce, that is the real crux for this for me. If you build that rail and you have that connectivity, mate, that'll transform our nation. Win-win. That's nation building. Did mm. you hear that? It's nation building. What's that show on the ABC? Do, the you, do, you, have, show? do you have a view on why that keeps sort of not, not being part of... Because the feasibility studies do not stack up. But if, mean, a, but if a private consortium was prepared to take on the cost of the rail, correct, in return for some land to make well, it turn that's a what profit, they make the profit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? So, well, but if, you, if governments think longer term, because this is our problem yeah, with four governments, year perspectives. they absolutely. It's all about staying in power, mm. as opposed to. I mean, there was there was an article I read, uh, about, um, a caucus meeting or some you know liberal meeting. So you know, they, and they were debating carbon tax. Mm, mm. You know, and one of the backbenchers stood up and said, I don't give a stuff about what's best for the Australian economy. I just want to keep my seat. 
Oh, <laughs> unbelievable! Like you know that that's they all think it, but they don't say it. I know, and he's gone and said it in front of everyone there, and it's like, whoa! Yeah. So you know that's the rumor yeah. to have said it, but mm. um, and they did quote the name in the article, but that's not relevant. The point I'm making there is, political parties. I know it's all about winning and being in power, but for God's sake, have some foresight and some vision because that's why we're disillusioned with you all because you won't make the tough decisions. It, speaking of which, I'm very happy for a tax reform. I'm yeah. absolutely happy for tax reform because one of the best ways of creating liquidity in the property market is drop stamp duties. Mm. Like bring the bring the value of stamp duty down so people can do you know play the property ladder story. Because the biggest challenge with playing the property ladder story now is, in and one, out. Yeah, well, they work out that it's going to cost them about two hundred thousand or three hundred thousand dollars in stamp duty as they make that initial purchase and the next purchase and the next purchase to get to where they want to go. Mm. So we just basically need a full review of that and, and then some political willpower to make these big changes. Interesting. Uh, put up a, a graphic on average floor space of newly built homes in um, in the UK, seventy six square meters. Mm-hmm. Um, USA, two hundred and fourteen oh. square meters. Yeah. So that's three times. But second, Australia, 206. So you've got UK at 76, you've got Ireland at 88, Spain at 97, France at 130, and Denmark at 137. They're used, they're used to smaller style living. We're just not used to it, yeah. but it's something that we're going to have to embrace. Yeah, we, you know, a big wide land that we are. The, the, and, and this will, be, this will come in the changes. City, yeah. So, you know, look, um, by all means, we've got to keep looking for solutions. Um, this is not here. We're, we're not here to come and sort of smack it on the head. But the best solutions are right in front of you with some vision. Even if the government did decide to build the the high-speed rail, there's got to be ways in which they will get the long-term benefit. I mean, the same with the Harbour Bridge. They put a a toll on that to uh, pay for it over time. Well, people are going to pay fares to want to live and move between these locations. And it's got to be affordable because, Mm. I mean, if I'm doing daily trips to the city... It's counterproductive if it's not. Correct. You know, but, but I, you know, they should own the land. And they should sell the land off. You know, there are there are government agencies that are responsible for land. And but un- understanding things. politics, it just seems to me that that would be a vote getter rather than a vote stealer. I agree. Because you're, they've even the, the consortium even thought about if they go to a, a, a populated town, they'll go 15, 20 k's out from that. So even that town doesn't get upset yeah. that they're running straight through it as well. So it's, yeah, um, the, it's that, that consortium, I did look at it. I would have preferred them to go the yeah, route absolutely. through Aubrey. Mm. Um, so, you know, you've got Seymour, Aubrey, uh, into Canberra. What's the little suburb um, or the little township near Canberra there? Goulburn. Goulburn, thank you. And then up into Sydney. Mm. There's your blueprint. Mm. You know, and Goulburn, mate, that's a town that's got beautiful, historical, beautiful home. That could explode mm. um, because obviously affordability in Canberra is starting to be a bit of a problem as well. So there is an opportunity absolutely. there. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, uh Mate, one thing I've got to say to you, mate, you should tell us what you really think. <laughs> <laughs> mate, well said, well said. So there you go, folks. Um, if you've been reading the headlines around housing affordability, there's something for you to ponder. But, mate, we've got a, uh, a couple of things to, to talk about. The Melbourne Property Buyer Show on the 24th to the 26th, you and I are going to be there. Uh, we're speaking each day. We're going to do a live record of the Property Couch on Saturday, Sunday, Saturday, I was, Saturday. And it will be at what time? Um, it's 11 o'clock. I think it's 11 o'clock, the live recording of the podcast. Live but we will put that on the website and we'll put it on Facebook. Yeah, we'll so if, it's, it's, if it's not 11, it's 12. But and it's if it's not 12, it's 1. So there you go, folks. We're, <laughs> giving, we're pretty much... Highly uh, organised. Yeah. Highly organised. But organized. Uh, we're going to be there. So any Melbourne people or anyone who wants to come to Melbourne at the time, come and say good day. We're going to have a proper couch booth. Um, all of the team will be there. So we might even have the stick there, Ben. Oh yes, come and meet the Stig. Come and meet the Stig. She'll sign, so. she'll sign the book that you're going to buy from us. Last week we did a <laughs> <laughs> last week we did a foundations um, topic. We did a I did a video on that Ben, so that's available on the website that people can check that out. Brilliant. Uh, if people want to follow us, social media, it's the Property Couch at Bryce Holdaway at Ben Kingsley AU AU for Twitter AU. So that's uh, on Insta, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, um, and of course we are chasing Tim, chase for Tim with uh, the five star reviews. So did we end up putting? We did it. We did really well this week. Did we? I think we had five or six. Okay. Did we do a, an instruction on how to do it, Ivis? Yeah. Yeah. Well okay. We've nice got work. that. So that's all available. Okay. So in terms of sign off, I'm going to do a life hack. Last week we did the uh, the black and white. If anyone's addicted to their phone. Yeah. Um, this week, uh, Evernote. Uh, you know I'm a big fan of Evernote. Oh, I know you're a big fan of Evernote. Tell it, us about it. It is the second brain. So if anyone hasn't downloaded Evernote, I reckon you go. I talked about Michael Hyatt, H Y A T T last week. Incidentally, interestingly, his 
ranking in the podcast really skyrocketed the oh, next day. So maybe very good. <laughs> uh, um, I like to think that anyway, even if it's not true. <laughs> yeah. Go to his uh, blog and type in Evernote, and he's got about 13 blogs, and they're brilliant. And so I use it as a second brain. I could not do everything that I do during the week. I see something, and I can't read it straight away. I file it for read it later. It just unbelievably uh, captures everything so that I can recall the search functions are amazing. I'll read a property article, I'll read the first bit, and I'll say... I've got to read that later. I'll just um, I'll put it to Evernote. I'll put a tag read later, and I just get on with my day. For the property couch, I tag it for everything that we need to do. I tag it. So anyone who hasn't used Evernote, um, I recommend you check it out. And for those of you that have, but you're not using it to its fullest potential, go and check out those blog posts on my site. Jeez, mate, we need to we need to Evernote need to send us a check for that. I know. But all, all, again, all, all of it's all, all free of our life hacks are royalty free. We're not. Yeah, the, we don't take business. any money from anyone. No cash for comment here, so um, we're waiting with bated breath for Did You Know? Oh, okay, so Did You Know? So this is my little interesting property fact. So I was fortunate enough, um, I think it was uh, late 2015, to um, to go to the Caribbean mm-hmm. um, on a little little cruise. Mm-hmm. And um, we dropped into a, a little place called St. Baths, which okay. um, if anyone knows that, uh, it's the French area of the Caribbean. And uh, it's got the famous airstrip that sort of, you sort of come just over a hill and you've got to land it, slam it down and pull up just before the beach. Mm. Very famous airstrip. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes, yeah. Yes, so that's yeah. that's called St. Bath. So it's a French French area. And um, I was uh, wandering through the township there on, on one of the days off the boat and I came across uh, Barnes Luxury Seasonal Rentals. Okay. Well, what's this about? They would okay. have been affordable. So, yeah, yeah. So, so I've, there's some, you know, a few little <laughs> beach houses and villas that I thought maybe we could take the missus with, you know, yeah. take the kids and go and have a look at And then I, um, I saw the prices, Bryce. And, Surely um, that would have been affordable. C- cities, um, only Melbourne and Sydney are unaffordable, aren't they? Um, yeah, yeah. And then I um, <laughs> saw the prices and I um, had to have a double look. Um, yeah, so I've got, I'm going to, we'll put a couple of these on the on the website and Facebook, but here's a couple for you. Um this little look nice, nice property. Uh, ocean views. Yeah. Um, you know, Horizon good. Edge Pool looks all right. You know, something you would uh, expect in beautiful tropical locations. Affordable. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I think so. Um, Sixty-seven thousand five hundred a week. A week. A week. US. Um, and fifteen percent tax. So we've got the ten percent um, standard administrative tax and the five percent luxury accommodation tax. Well, so I'm, I'm like, whoa, like, whoa, geez, that's that's interesting. That must be one of the more expensive ones in the magazine. No, no, it's not. No, no, here's another one. $107,000 a week. Ooh. Yes, uh, you know, Villa Papaya. Oh, uh, that Villa sounds Papaya, like a sign off. <laughs> the French, Villa Papaya. Um, that's a lazy yet, yeah, $107,000 a week. So we'll, um, yeah, that one. That one was quite interesting. Mate, mate, I can't afford that on my wage, but you can. So can I maybe can <laughs> yeah, I, can yeah, I, bunk, can right. I bunk in with you? A week, yeah, a yeah, week. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there you go. There are people in this in this world who can uh, afford to. Now, there's obviously a couple for sale as well at the front. Now, this is two years old, so I think prices have probably gone up a little bit. You know, if we've got um, one place here is only 3.3 million euro. So we could, you know, we could, we could potentially have a pull, look at that. Pull one. a hat around with the team. So there you go. So, so luxury seasonal rentals. Um, so going down to Portsy for the weekend uh, over Christmas, where you might be paying, you know, a thousand bucks. Yeah, for well, the I was going to say it's probably more, a little bit more expensive, maybe yeah. two and a half thousand dollars for the week. Yeah. Well, oh, the just, weekend, yeah. just uh, take your uh, take your take a note of that. I thought that was just. I think Hawaii is cheap too, isn't it? I think um, Nathan Tinkler from uh, Newcastle. <laughs> I think he's going over to sell his um, beach yeah, his front. Little, it's a, um, his ex-wife's help, helping sell the house. I think, I think it's fifteen million. Few so. bills, few bills to pay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> there you go, folks. Uh, obviously, tongue in cheek, that uh, housing affordability is not um, just a problem in Australia. It's a, it's a challenge around all mega cities uh, around the world. But uh, hopefully, that debate has helped you, folks. And um, a couple of things: if you've got any life hacks or you've got any uh, interesting property facts, uh, let us know. Info at thepropertycouch.com.au. We'd love to read them out each week. But uh, until next week, Ben. See you later. See you later.